here we go again. We are having a recording, and this is for Mary Jo Robinson and stories, recollections, impacts that she's had on our lives. And looks like we've got a very close friend here on two fronts one with me, and of course, one with Mary Jo. And I think I'm pretty sure Mary Jo probably preceded us. I'm pretty sure. What is that right, Debbie Ann? Yes. Mm. Okay. That's what I thought. So what do you, I'm just going to get out of the way here, man. So you can tell stories or whatever you want to do about Mary Jo. So I met Mary Jo through a mutual friend of ours um, who has since passed away. Um, Roxanne Flynn. Do you remember her? I do remember her. So that's how I came in to that circle with Mary Jo was on Friday nights, um, usually like once in a, once a month, we would go out with um, a group of us and Mary Jo would come out and her energy was just amazing. And that level of forgiveness, that's who we are trying to get to that point of being able to forgive. And some days I do it well, and some days, that's our, that's our opportunity of learning, you know, of where our resentments are or our wounding. And she was such a great example of forgiveness, like how she could have done that. Losing a child, I know what it's like to lose a child, not in that similar way, but through the disease of alcoholism. So for her, like she is one of those um, mentors that you aspire to be like at the end of your life. She lived with that grace um, and she was funny. So when I first met her, I was intimidated by her because I was like, oh, I've heard a lot about Mary Jo, but oh my gosh, like she would just let loose on Friday nights. Like she would just, yeah, maybe some inappropriate shenanigans that we had going on within our group, but wow, just, um, you think about her energy and um, you just take that with you into your heart. Yeah, shenanigans would be maybe Mary Jo's middle name too. <laughs> and I can just imagine what she would be like, you know, um, around the ladies and, oh, ain't no guys around, <laughs> you know, let loose. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she she uh, she was a, quite a character. Um, I know this might not sound flattering to some people, but there's a little story about that she told me in the recovery church, and I don't know if she mentioned it to you. And this is just a little addendum here, and I'll uh, I'll step aside once again. But you reminded me of it, uh, shenanigans, and she was really honest about her shortcomings, you know, and um, I was talking to her one day and she approached me kind of like you know something was up she said oh geez I can't believe I did this I stole somebody's winter gloves they were laying on the the little shelf by a window and I don't know they must have set them down or something who knows she said and I saw them and I snatched them I stole them <laughs> it's like oh my gosh you know and she's telling me in this and she's like my spiritual advisor sponsor telling me she stole something from somebody and um and she said but it brought him back I felt so bad but why did I do that and it, you know to me that was very encouraging that she showed how you can just be honest and own your stuff and you don't have to be perfect because you're in long-term recovery um because you're a Christian or whatever it is, it's like she screwed up and she admitted it. And, um, you know, to be honest out loud is not easy for a lot of people. And she did that, you know. So there's just a little story that's like, that doesn't sound very flattering. We're talking about trying to tell cool stories about Mary Jo. That is a really cool story, in my opinion. You know? That is a great story. Because it's true. Like she you know, she would own up to that stuff. You know, um, she would talk about, you don't, you know, she taught her and I at that time, I'm trying to remember, um, like, because 
I met her, oh, maybe like three years before she passed. Um, and I had known about her through recovery circles and stuff like that. But um, she would just really own her stuff. And she said, when you get into double digits, it, it, it's actually harder to stay sober. She said, because you are more present to your feelings, to your emotions, than what you were early on. Because early on, you were just diving into your stuff, cleaning up the wreckage of the past. Well, as you stay in recovery, the wreckage of the past comes lower. So it's that daily living that can just really stir that pot. And um, based on a spiritual practice each day, just doing what we can to turn it over. And you think about her and her husband, George. They partnered in what they did, not just individually, but together. You know, it just, um, and he was the love of her life. He would, she would talk about him a lot um, and how much she missed him. Mm -hmm. She really struggled with the caretaking with him um, at, at one point, you know, and, um, you know, she had a lot on her shoulders. And I think those of us that have had to caretake somebody, um, even if you got the biggest heart and you got the strongest soul and, and really good impetus, there's times where you can feel wore down, you know, because it takes a lot to caretake for someone that is high, high physical maintenance, and, um, you know, you don't always have time to be fed. You're busy feeding. And, um, and I remember her talking about George and, and how important, of course, he was and, and the journey they had together. And seeing those two together when I first uh, met them was um, when I first met them together, they were laughing and stuff. And there was always kind of an uneasy something there that I could sense, you know. And I don't know, it's just simply because you have a couple and there's somebody else in the room. So there might always be holding back a little bit. That's kind of normal, you know. And um, but they but their synergy felt amazing to me. And you know, imagine the miracles that had to happen to get CRC going. For those that don't know what CRC is, it's Christ Recovery Center. Um you have some memories of her at the sing along. You were, uh, did you have something there? Or? Um, I didn't go to the sing along. I wasn't, um, I would go occasionally. Like, Same here. Honestly, like mm -hmm. twice a year. I wasn't a big um, sing along. Ironically, we lived um, in Badness, not too far from Christ Recovery Center. Um, and we did some things over there, but. Um, that was after she passed away. So like our lives had just different intersections of meeting and stuff. A majority of it came through Roxanne though, towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Do you have a story of Mary Jo and Roxanne maybe? Oh my gosh. The two of them were like two peas in a pod. The sarcasm would just fly. <laughs> and so when you talk about, you know, being that observing and being in that relationship and the two of them are just like going back and forth, back and forth. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, they would, um, yeah, they would, Friday nights would get a little out of hand sometimes because yeah, that sarcasm probably crossed the line a couple of times in certain areas. Yeah, I wonder, sometimes I wondered if they were uh, having a contest or something, you know. I think there was that <laughs> one up there. Who yeah, be better? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They, it's like, um, you thought that was funny. Check this out. Yeah. And then they'd say mm -hmm. something, and then right away, the other one would try to counter, counter check it, you know. Mm -hmm. Ryan reminded me of a couple of uh, uh, comedian hockey players or something, you know checking each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll give you that hip check into the wall there <laughs> yeah right and uh and the bigger the audience you know the more people were watching them the the more riotous it would 
get until somebody would level off and go, oh, and look around, you know? <laughs> right. And what she loved too is um, the attention. Like when she would, so you would, you know, at the beginning of the conversation and stuff each night, you know, how was your week? What was going on? Or where have you been? Just kind of that normal check in of that relationship. But then you get to a certain part of that conversation after dinner that's where the wisdom came in you know she would talk about how hard sobriety can be she would talk about hey don't do what I did maybe try it a different way um and that's good eldership in the recovery rooms um and how blessed you were to have really worked with her for a number of years from what I remember um, and Roxanne worked with her in various ways, um, not just in recovery, but through some court stuff too. So, but yeah, she would, you could just be sitting there and you could just feel the presence and however you name it, but that power greater than yourself, that source that would come through her, it would channel. And if you could just stop and pause and listen, um and just go wow and then she would just like that she'd go from having this intense we're all like listening like what's mary gonna mary joe gonna say you're on this cliff and then all of a sudden she changes it and she's just laughing about something else that just you know that she did or something like that so um she would love to get that attention and then all of a sudden um she would just break up and just say something silly. You know, it is funny that before a speech, um, she would counsel me to um, play it seriously, you know, and I would always come out with some kind of a joke or something, you know, and I don't know if it was lack of confidence that would make me use gregarity as kind of a, a warm up to being real or what I, I don't know but it's one of the few areas I never really took her advice very well but she said she would say play it straight it's like um I don't know if I'm capable of that but you know she would challenge me and and I thought you know when has she played it straight <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like take your own inventory you know so um but i think i think she was one of those people it's like um you know around the rooms i've heard people that are old timers sometimes say this um and i think i'm i took it really seriously and i and i knew it's like sobriety's first it's it's just first and for me god is first and um, it doesn't mean that I don't care about people. It doesn't mean I don't care about myself. But, um, you know, it's like I love God with all my heart and I love others as myself in that order. And if, if I'm in a relationship with somebody who is uncomfortable with service work, you know, the relationship's probably not going to work out real well, maybe. I mean, I would do my best to adjust, you know, because I love the person. I'm in a relationship and I and I respect that person, you know, and I love that person. And I, I try to put them in a place that is uh, just a little bit above my own interests, you know. So it's not like I don't care about them. But I also know that if I'm if I'm not doing God's will as I understand God's will in my life, then I'm going to lose that relationship anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think Mary Jo was a little like that. And, and, you know, she would put service work on such a high level that maybe even her family might have felt a little bit ignored, you know. And, um, and that's kind of like, it's just how we know it is. We have to do this, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was that attitude that she brought to me when she first wanted me to be in mad, right? You know, and I said, no. And she said, yes. I said, no. <laughs> she said, we, when we're asked to do service work, we don't say no. 
and uh, you know that whole thing. You know that story. But um, but the value of making amends to those we had harmed is is part of service work, you know, and and it's like if somebody makes amends to me like in a tenth step then it makes me feel valued as a human being right well there was something about mary joe that every time i was in contact with her i had a lot of respect i didn't put her on her pedestal but i had a lot of respect and, but i always felt valued you know there's always something there you just know that she loves and values people you know and i don't know if you have maybe a, a story where she particularly helped you overcome anything. I don't care how trivial or major it is. If you're willing to share something big, fine. If not, that's fine. Well, I do remember um, one of the conversations about service work. Um, there was myself, Roxanne, there was a group of us. Um, and so the, at one point, what would happen was we would switch <clears throat> And we'd move, like the girls would move down um, together and have that conversation and stuff. Um, and she was talking about service work, like what service work did you do? Um, and so you kind of got into that pattern. She was gonna ask you, what service work are you doing? You know, are you working with a sponsee? Are you, you know, are you involved some in some part of your recovery within the business part? And how are you supporting others? You know, your avenue was mad. My was an Alano club, my boat Alano club. And, <clears throat> excuse me, making sure that other alcoholics had a safe place. And we just do our best that we, you know, that we can with that. But she would call you um, out on service work. What I remember her having a conversation with someone, why aren't you doing service work? Well, cause no one's asking. She goes that she goes, you're not listening then. And I remember like the person didn't get that. And I got that. And I think that's why it was so instilled in me that service work was important and on, and finding that balance, you know, of giving back. But I do, that was, that was my aha moment of that's why you do service work is because you want to give back. But in that conversation about listening, how important listening is. Um, and so, and being accountable, you know, I never, <laughs> I never wanted to go to, you know, to go to dinner and just, you know, not be able to answer that question. Like my anxiety would like, I'm like, okay, you know, and then all of a sudden, like she might not even ask you about doing service work. Like you're, you know, you're like, okay, yep, I, I'm, I'm all good. And then the whole night you forget about it. And then like a couple of days later you go, she never asked me about service work this week. <laughs> how dare she? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. She, and um, I would have to say, um, I was, I come from a very dysfunctional family and I remember her telling me, you know, just let your son do what he needs to do. And um, it has taken a lot of Al-Anon meetings um, to be able to just really let go of that. And I haven't seen him now for a couple of years. You know, we're on that break. And that's that doesn't mean in my morning prayers that I just wish him the very best or I do the loving kindness meditation where it starts with me and then it goes to him. And I do that with my grandson because I don't get to see my grandson. So um, one of the things that she also taught me is just because I'm in recovery doesn't mean I'm going to get everything that I lost back. And I forgot that. I forgot that when my bonus daughter passed away, that mm -hmm. I felt I deserved everything that I've lost. I wanted that back. And it's interesting um, how grief affects us in recovery. 
And Mary Jo talked about how different grief is when you're sober. Um, and that can be very painstaking on so many levels. But if you show up and you do the work, your life will be a lot more peaceful. Yeah, doing uh, grief work isn't for sissies. I no. mean, you know, no. it's like if you don't want to grow up, stay out of a relationship. And, you know, Good and if point. you're going to if you're going to get in a relationship, you're going to know some grief. You know, sometimes yeah. we lose the people, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, talk about uh, friends of Lois, you know. Um, Mary Jo, you know, would tell me some things in, in my relationship. And I'm just going to quote her uh, when I was struggling with my with my ex. She says, I don't want to hear any of that. He said, she said shit. Like, oh, crap, slap my ego down, will you, you know, and I didn't really think I was doing that, but she said it and just hearing, hearing things that make us uncomfortable, help us grow up, you know, and I think relationships, however they, they look, they do that. And um, I, I really took Mary Jo seriously. And I did, you know, my fifth step with her. And, um, but I wouldn't have done that if God wouldn't have told me to, mm -hmm. you know, um, I did not want to do a fifth step, you know, and, uh, I was at the Maplewood club where I met you and Jerry and, um, uh, my Friday night meeting was my home group. <clears throat> um, and I really got tired of hearing that guy sitting where I was sitting, saying <laughs> I, on a step four and step five meeting or something, well, I haven't really done this step. No, I got so tired of hearing that, you know, but I didn't trust anybody, you know, except for maybe Mary Jo, but I didn't trust her enough to ask her to actually work toward it. And I figured, well, God knows what I did. What do I need to tell another human being for, you know? But um, some guy just said, you know, someone else got tired of hearing me say it too, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and he, he, uh, he said, well, just pick a date on a calendar and then just find somebody to ask to hear your fifth step, you know, just commit, do something, man. And because uh, I had said in the meeting, I'm tired of saying this. I haven't really done the step. And there's something about being honest that really clears, you know, it clears a path to clearing a path. <laughs> you know Definitely. you know and i thought okay i set the date in my calendar and um and i asked god you know i got on my knees and i said a prayer and no sooner than i hit my knees and i was so serious about it i actually got on my knees usually i don't do that you know and I, and I just said all right god if you want me to do a fifth step you're gonna have to show me who to do it with and immediately i saw her face as if she was right there looking at me. And I could see every line in her face more clearly than if I was literally looking at her. And there was this, this spiritual white light within that, that image of her face. And I've seen that white light before. And it's like, it's when I see it, I know that it's from God. And so I knew immediately it happened so fast and it was so real and so vivid right there in front of me. And I couldn't have imagined it, Debbie Ann. I couldn't have, you know. And um, and I didn't have time to set it up to even imagine it. It's like, bam, you know. I mean, that's those are my own words. Maybe I did it psychologically. I don't know. A psychiatrist might tell me something, but I know the light of God when I see it, and it was in in that image. So I knew right away God uh, was using Mary Jo to um, help me in my life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I, I called her up and I asked her if she would hear my fifth step. And she told me, go away. Don't bother. No, she didn't say that. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so, um, but you know, the, the strange thing is, is that when it's like, when I did a real fifth step with her, she looked like she got hit with a, a, a sledgehammer when I told her the worst thing I did. And, uh, that's probably an exaggeration. I'm projecting. 
but she rocked back and forth and she stared at me with wide eyes on blinking, you know, but she, she knew that she was hearing a real fifth step. And when she got all the way through, she told me something that she had done in her life that she had only shared with two or three people. And, um, and I, I, I she, there was such an awakening there for me. It welcomed me back to the human race. But I think that that point forward, she started telling people in her fifth steps because she, she saw the value of that after that. It's like it, it really humanized um, me to know that. And I, and I looked at her and I said, you, you know, and I didn't, I thought only men committed certain kinds of uh, um infractions in life and and i never had a woman admit something um and and uh, it's like it stripped away everything you know it just did it just humanized everything and obviously you know you you you, you can detect a little bit of what she was talking about i think i'm not going to say what that was a thousand horses couldn't drag that out of my mouth because it was stated in private and um but you know there is just this this thing that happened, I, I really think like she was a tool in God's hands, you know? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Like, um, there's certain people that I sit, that I'll say they have a direct connection. They have the 911 line. <clears throat> they have the 911 line. Um, and she was one of them, you know? And um, I, a friend of mine who passed away a um, couple years ago, she was like that. She had that 911 connection. And that's rare. You know, we aspire to be that way. Um, I hope at the end of my life that I will be that way. Um, but yeah, Mary jo, Mary Jo was one of those people. She had that 911 connection. And because I know who you are and how spiritual you are, even from years past, I can see why you would see that vision, that experience um, when you're asking for help, you know? Yeah. So I, um, yeah, thank you. I, um... Uh, coming from from you it's easier to take that uh seriously <laughs> you know um i was gonna say something but as soon as somebody ever says anything you know a little bit <laughs> uh like that i i'm always at a loss for words you know um but thank you you know just just gratitude and you know we are in this together and um I, you know, I, I found it really ironic that we're getting this thing going on Mary Jo's sober date, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. March 9th, 1968. And I found that out quite by accident. I don't have it in my calendar, Debbie. And I wish I had it in my mind. It's like, <laughs> and you're probably wondering, geez, he must really have loved Mary Jo. He even knew his sober, her sober date. <laughs> No, no, no. It was one of her family members that had it on, on their uh, website, and I ripped off the information. I told March 9th, well, I'll be darn gummed, you know? <laughs> wow, and how yeah, we were right? supposed to meet last night, and I mm -hmm. was like so sure it was today. Right? Well, that was that's the thing. You know, what was odd is I, I saw in writing that we had agreed on the 8th, but I had the 9th in my calendar. And I thought, well, how can that be? Did we agree on the ninth and I forgot? But whatever, it maybe Mary Jo was in the works there. She says, no, nah, no, nah, they're going to talk on the ninth. Screw all your, your planning stuff, you know. And, and, oh, my gosh, isn't that true? Yeah, right. Get out of the so, way. I can yep. just hear her. Get out of the mm -hmm. way. Um, I, I, you know, I'd heard this before, but she, in the recovery church, she came up to me just chuckling and laughing. And she says, oh, Timothy, I just heard the funniest thing ever. You're just going to love this stuff, you know? And, uh, and she said, when I make, want to make God laugh, I just tell him my plans. 
and it's like she had been around for 20 years and sobriety 30 years maybe at that point and 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 i had heard that so many times and um you know but it, she was just like a little girl and she'd hear stuff you know and um i she think had a great we, giggle. Mm -hmm. she did. <laughs> I, I i think in i think in recovery um to at to some extent more with some of us than with others maybe but i think we get our our innocence back you know and oh, definitely. you know and uh it's kind of like what we were like before we got damaged starts resurfacing you know and we got to hang around with, you know, stick with the winners, hang around with people that aren't abusers and stuff. You know, we can handle so much of the world and the world can be a real tough place sometimes. But, so we need a soft place to land um, and having the discernment who to not be around. Um, it, I think it's a connection. It's a divine connection that we have to rely on. But we can only access that connection through our innocence. We can't, you know. It, it is connected to us regardless of how damaged we are that's always there you know we can have miracles and things show up but for us to have that innocent connection there's something else that happens you know and people can see the that light in us and um i know this isn't about mary joe um but i i was listening to a meditation on my way to a speech and, and the speech was in um i was passing michael i can't remember the name of the city anymore it's been so long but i was listening to this this um uh, you've ever heard of soaking music no it, it's just a it's a a form of uh a christian meditation okay. and uh, there's this uh, uh, rivera uh, kimberly and roberto rivera uh, they sing together and they've got this very um, focused, peaceful music. And you just let it, you just soak in that music. And, and there is one song, uh, Shine, Jesus, Shine is the name of it. And, um, and I was listening to that over and over and over again on the way to the speech, you know, and I could just feel it, you know. And, and of course, Jesus said, be his little children for such as the kingdom of heaven, you know. And I'm not being a religious zealot when I say these things. Is that, you know, that principle uh, applies to everyone, and as far as I can tell, it doesn't matter if you're Christian or not. And um, but when I got there and I gave the speech, this lady, in fact, two or three people, but for sure, I remember this one woman came up and she says, "You know why?" She she first she said, "Are you a Christian?" I thought, well, that's weird. I don't get that question very often. You know, I, I try to not do the J word or the G word in, you know, secular speeches. And uh, I still, you know, say the G word, God. I almost never say the J word, Jesus, you know, because it's just too uh, religious. And, um, and, I, and I said, well, I'm not a good one, but yeah, I suppose, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and because uh, I, I like bad language sometimes and bad jokes or whatever let's call it shenanigans just to make it sound prettier, you know? And, uh, <laughs> um, but she said that, she said, I could see the spirit of Christ shining from your face. And that song was saying, shine, Jesus, shine from our faces, you know? And uh, I thought, ah, oh, there's something to this stuff, you know? <laughs> um but that that innocence where we get all of our thinking out of the way you know and it just remembering her laughter her giggles you know and and getting that sincere hug and it's like it's transmitting uh it's almost like transmitting a good virus <laughs> you know and um yeah. you know and we get inoculated or something you know to use present day language which there's so many emotions about these days but um but you know what i suppose we should wrap this up um is there any one idea that is uh maybe shining in your consciousness right now you'd like to share as we get ready to close on the mary joe stuff for me if she inspires me still 
um, she's got that, yeah, that she had that 911 connection. She embodied um, source. Source is always in us, however you define that. But she really was reducing that ego. And that, as the longer we stay in um, recovery, that's the goal, is to lessen that ego and to return to who, that innocence, you know, who we were meant to be. You know, we're a child of the divine, however you state that, God, divine, Sophia, Yahweh. We are, we are of the divine, but getting there sometimes is the challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, and on our, when you're in the recovery rooms, you get a medallion and it says, to thine own self be true. And the opportunity that we've had since COVID has started is to return to the authentic self. And what does that mean? And we have to sort and we have to sift and go through that. And how lucky are we to have people similar to Mary Jo and many others who have gone before us and who will come after us to guide us, to mentor us, to have that light shine so bright like yourself, to have that in this world because this world is a challenge, you know? And um, deep gratitude for you for doing this and how it just, it, it just warms my heart that her sobriety date was today. And mm -hmm. here we are talking about her. Um, you know that she had that shenanigan planned. Mm -hmm. I betcha. At the time. <laughs> you just know. That's funny. Yeah, she's, yeah so. she's, she's watching over us. Maybe, uh, I think she comes in once in a while and takes a pink, a peek, you know, I think when we love the veil gets thinner and, uh, we can see on both sides occasionally and mm -hmm. feel that love. Um, there's a group called delirium. They've got a song return to innocence. I think I'm going to look it up and, uh, post that along with the post on, on Facebook. I'm going to take this download it to YouTube and transfer it to the Mary Jo Robinson page. And if you know someone that knew her, you know, feel free to invite them to the group, you know, and would try and expand the ripple effect that she had in our lives. And um, I, I think it's kind of cool that maybe at some point family members will be able to see these videos, you know, and see that, um, you know, the difference that Mary Jo made in so many people's lives and and you just never know you know yeah and continues you know and continues right her, you know her legacy continues amen mm -hmm. yeah all right sister love you peace out love you too namaste namaste blessings bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.